very much, and Eliza. There's a kind bar if you're hungry. There's a what? Oh, great. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the um, artist panel as part of the Equipping the Arts in Canada class. Um, my name is Eliza Chandler, um, and I'm the professor of this class, and I'm going to give a few opening remarks before we hand it over to the artist. So I'll start by reading Ryerson's Land Acknowledgement and then move into a more um, situated, reflexive elaboration, which was collectively written by folks in the School of Disability Studies, specifically Esther Ignani, Laurie Erickson, and myself. So Toronto and Ryerson University are located on indigenous land bound by the Dish with One Spoon Covenants. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, the Haudenosaunee people, as well as the people of the Credit River. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, settlers, newcomers, and folks who have been forced to relocate here through slave trade and international forced labor trades, immigrants, refugees, and displaced people have all been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Those of us who live, work, and create in this territory, which spans from what is now called the Great Lakes to the Ontario-Quebec border, to Lake Simcoe and into upstate New York, we all eat out of the dish with only one spoon. This means that we all share in the responsibility of ensuring that the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share the land with. Importantly, there are no knives at the table representing that we all must keep the, keep the peace. Land acknowledgments do not exist in the past tense or in historical context. Colonialism is, current, is a current ongoing process. Land acknowledgment as a practice must prompt us to think carefully about relationships, individually and collectively, to the land, to indigenous people, and to processes of, of colonialism. I am, a one, I am a white settler, one who benefits daily from settler colonialism on the side of settler privilege in my life, work, and practices. In relation to this talk today, my experience of disability is marked by this privilege, making it easy for me to claim, claim disability, a marker which has traditionally been associated with the category of non-human, with identity and pride. This claiming of this identity is contingent on how I'm, I am otherwise recognized as human because of my settler privilege, making it easy for me to be recognized as belonging within disability arts community, a recognition which has given me power and privilege as evidenced by my position in this classroom today. As part of our ongoing commitment to the project of decolonization in the school, we work through a recognition that there are multiple and contested relationships to disability amongst marginalized communities. For instance, as, as Susan Dion tells us, notions of defectiveness that have been imposed by, upon indigenous bodies and lives through colonial knowledge systems, like the system of education, have been used to justif as justification for state-sanctioned violences, such as the 60s scoop, and have meant that the inscription of disability, not, sorry, and have meant that the, that the inscription of disability, madness, and other non-normativity further have threatened, sorry, I missed something, okay, have further th threatened indigenous people's access to the category of the fully human. And this makes claiming, the dis the claiming disability identity and pride a privilege that not everyone has access to. 
We are dedicated to being inclusive of multiple ways that we relate to the categories and languages of disability, understanding that claiming, projecting, and otherwise relating to disability are all personal and political moves that, informed our polit that informs our politics and understandings. Other ways that we, we work towards decolonization um, at the school includes reading and enacting the recommendations put forth by the Truth and Reconciliation Report, meaningfully using the writings and knowledges of Indigenous scholars on our syllabus and in our lectures, and by working with and taking direction from Indigenous elders and leaders, including those in our classrooms and in communities, to learn and teach not just about the violence of colonialism, but also about Indigenous creation, joy, and exuberance, or in the Ann Simpson's word, um, bring me a day to win. Today we are inviting you into the Cripping the Arts class. This is a liberal studies class taught through the School of Disability Studies. This is an upper level um, liberal studies course on Table B, and it's open to all Ryerson students across the university. Um, this course, DST 508, is taught in the fall semester each year, so if you haven't taken it already, please sign up. This also can work towards the Disability Studies minor, which is also available to all Ryerson students, and if you're at all interested in um, pursuing that minor, please get in touch with me or Paris McGray or anyone here at the school. Um, the School of Disability Studies is a part-time degree completion program, and it's taught um, through a combination of online and on-site classes. Our classes take up disability, mad identity, and deafhood as integral uh, to interdisciplinary and intersectional scholarly and activist projects concerned most directly with rethinking embodied difference, advancing disability rights and justice, and transforming socio-political structures and hegemonic beliefs which cause intersectional oppressions. If you're at all interested in becoming a student, please get in touch with us. This event is accessible in many ways. Thanks to our ASL interpreters, our live captioners, and their attendants. We are also live streaming, and the recording of the live stream will be available after the archive. Um, we say hello to people who are joining us from the, art, from the live stream and really welcome you as meaningful participants here with us today. And note on washrooms, if you leave this classroom, which I know is very hot, um, you can turn right and, and then sort of straight forward and you'll find an all gender accessible fully, um, sorry, single stall washroom. If you turn uh, right, you'll find two, two banks of fe um, uh, female specific accessible washrooms. Um, any one of us sort of standing around can help direct you to the washrooms. Um, we, uh, this is a relaxed space, so we invite you to make yourself comfortable. Sit up, uh, sorry, not sit up, sit down. Slouch <laughs> as you want to. Stand up, um, uh, move around, fidget, um, stim, leave, come back, um, whatever you need to do. There's food up here and there's water around, so please feel free to, to relax into this space. Thanks to Kim Collins um, and the School of Disability Studies for supporting our access today. And Lindsay, thanks Lindsay. Where is the, uh, the long, is there a link? Or a there is, and it's on any of the promotional materials. So any of the flyers or um, anything like that. Um, that's a good point. Can you check out that if it's on the? Yeah, that would be great. Oh, that's great. Google Rycast, and it's the only live video right now. Thanks. Um, so as I've said, um, this event is part of our Crips in the Arts class, and as such, it will run as follows. The students, so we're being facilitated by a student group today. So um, in a few short moments, I'll hand the mic over to the student group. They'll introduce the artists on the panel, 
the artists will present for a good amount of time, and then the students have um, written some questions specifically related to the themes of the class that they will ask. At that point, we'll open it up for general, general Q&A. Regardless of what we get in that program, the event will end sharply at 2 um, because there's another class co coming in. Uh, one more thing before we get started. Uh, Vanessa Dion Fletcher is delivering a performative lecture, European Day Lesson, next Wednesday at 5 p.m. at OISE, which is at 252 Floor Street West, right on top of the St. George subway station. This is the final event of her Indigenous Artists in Residence, so please come to that event. Uh, before I hand the mic over, is there any, any other... Um, Announcement or anything I've forgotten? No? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so now we'll hand it over to, to Zoe. Thank you. Okay, so um, my name is Zoe, and I have um, the privilege to welcome our first guest today, um, artist. Her name is Rebecca Sweets, also known as Rebecca Zala. Um, she was born in Mexico and lived in Scarborough, grew up there. Um, she is a graduate from Ryerson. She graduated from the Creative Industries program. Um, she now continues to work out of Toronto um, through her practice as a multidisciplinary artist. Um, as described through her portfolio, she characterizes her art through tangible performance and interactive mediums. She also explores the cosmic enhancements and hindrances of digitally circling between intimacy, identity, and the imagination. She has worked with many galleries throughout the city, um, many known as the I Akin Collective, exhibited works at the Trinity Square Video, Gardner Museum, Gladstone Hotel, and the Super Wonder Gallery. Is there another slide? Testing this, test. Can everyone hear me fine? Is this loud enough? Okay. Um, all right, thank you so much for that intro. Um, just gonna bring this closer to me so I can go back and forth better. Okay. So yeah, um, hi, I'm Rebecca Sweets. I'm a multidisciplinary um, artist. I do mad art and disability art as well. And uh, yeah, I graduated from Ryerson for Creative Industries and I've actually taken this class last year, so it's nice to be back. And um, yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about my art practice and uh, about some of the works that I um, have done and some that I'm currently working on. So that includes, uh, the first one is I'm Not Angry, I'm Mad, which is a zine and Love My Dysfunctions, which is a solo exhibition I'm working on right now, and uh, Essaying, which is a video art piece in that exhibition, and Mad Grad, which is an event. So, I'm Not Angry, I'm Mad is a 22-page zine um, kind of surrounding collective experiences of systemic ableism and sanism in academia, um, and uh, I had um, talked to a, a lot of my like mad friends um, who are in school about it. And for those who don't know, um, MAD is a term that's um, like a reclaimed slur and an umbrella term similar to the term queer. Uh, and it's for those who identify as psychiatric survivors, mental health system consumers, uh, neurodivergent, and are having a mental illness. So I'm going to go through some of the different parts of the zine. Um, in this first one, uh, just an image description. It's a, a blue background, um, two-page uh, spread of the zine, and there's different screenshots of um, MAD students asking for extensions, exceptions, accommodation requests from professors, um, and some uh, like personal screenshots of uh, what that's like behind the scenes, messaging your friends about it. And I chose these screenshots because I wanted to illustrate the great lengths that uh, MAD students and students in general have to go through in order to attain their accommodations and buck against uh, sanest ideas that these are like a free pa pass. And um, I also wanted to highlight 
the groveling language that a lot of students um, find themselves having to use in order to get their accommodations, um, which can come from an academic culture and policy that promotes that you know, good students finish their work on time and don't need many accommodations, and you know, bad students who become a problem are ones who constantly need help, need accommodations, etc. So there's language and patterns in here that say things like, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for, uh, like, apologizing for one's health and disability issues, um, self-blaming, um, and just trying to show that, you know, I'm not lazy, I'm not irresponsible, I'm not trying to cheat the system. And the next part of this zine is where I collected different promotional materials um, around Ryerson for mental health programming and wellness initiatives. And in collaging these, I wanted to highlight how a lot of these wellness initiatives can be used as a tool to individualize mental health issues and put the onus on the MAD student to maintain their mental health rather than have the university be held accountable for the extreme stress that can be put on students and the lack of mental health resources. Um, I feel like there's a lot of messages that are saying, you know, if you're mentally unwell, you know, go pet a therapy dog or try the yoga program, take our resiliency building program, and um, not really taking accountability from the school side. And on top of that, I've layered over and collected headlines from the Eye Opener and the Ryersonian. And I was really interested in the different narratives formed from these headlines. So I'm going to read uh, the one on the very left side of the page. And it says, new wellness center coming to the SCC. RSU wellness center is still in the work set to open next year. Wellness center finally opening, but without Muslim chaplaincy. RSU's wellness center opening delayed for the third time. And lastly, RSU wellness center ceases operations. So, um, yeah, this project is still in its first iteration, but I'd like to continue to collect MAD student experiences and emails. So, uh, if there is something that you are interested in sharing to this project, like, please contact me. Um, and these, the themes in this scene are really well reflected in my upcoming solo exhibition, which I'm going to talk about next. So I have a solo exhibition at the Margin of Ears Gallery next year in February, and it's called Love My Dysfunctions. And it is a conceptual and immersive installation art um, exhibition on my personal experiences of sanism and ableism in academia through lens of executive dysfunction, uh, the dominant symptom of ADHD. And so I've had two goals for this exhibition. Um, one, I would like viewers to understand both the subtle and the salient ways in which systemic ableism and sanism operates in higher education and uh, the pernicious trickle-down effects this has for MAD and neurodivergent students. And I'd also like for viewers to unlearn a legacy of misinformation about ADHD and walk away with a more informed understanding um, of it as a self-regulation disorder, but also as a diagnosis that's very highly informed by capitalist values around productivity. So there are five installations in the show, and each installation is around a different executive dysfunction, so things such as time regulation or emotional regulation, um, working memory, and it's a multi-sensory show with a maximalist aesthetic. Um, I think one takeaway from this class is that I took, away, I took this class last year is definitely taking um, access as a point of creativity and something to um, consider and draw from from the get-go. So um, it's definitely not an afterthought. And um, I have um, some installations such as a wall that's just full of my documentation, um, almost like a conspiracy board full of candid emails and medical notes and report cards. Um, and in the middle of the gallery, there was going to be a messy desk full of like trash and moving boxes and a pile of clothes and um, things that you can touch or move around, a bag of chips that you could reach your hand into and eat from. Um, so ultimately, I explore and validate my own madis madness and I uh, unify it with highlighting how you know, political models and values upheld in academia can serve to harm and discriminate against um, MAD students um, from my own personal experience. So I'm still working on this show, but there is a video art piece in the show, uh, which I finished, which I want to show you next. So this is a piece called Essaying, 
and it is a webcam documentation of myself trying to pull an all-nighter in the pod uh, while attempting to write an essay. I use a lot of um, like, uh, spasmodic edits and like quick cuts to portray the hyperactivity and distraction of a neuromagical ADHD mind, and I highlight both the executive dysfunctions of like focus and you know sustaining attention and, and shifting tasks, but also um, I wanted to highlight um, some inaccessibility in academia. So um, you know one reason I was pulling this all nighter is I wasn't allowed a longer extension to write this essay. I had ran out of passes. So the uh, clip I'm going to show you is an interesting one. Um, it's one where the janitor comes to like stop and talk to me and we listen to a song that he wrote about Sheldon Levy. <laughs> but um, yeah. <laughs> Oh wait, is the sound working okay? Okay. been here since uh, overnight, actually. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I was just trying to finish up this. Yeah, yeah thank you. So yeah, that's that. Um, it's a really funny video because in the comments everyone's like, like this if the janitor forced you to watch this video. <laughs> um, how do I go back to full screen? Hold on. I got it. Okay. So um, the next piece I'm going to talk about is also part of my solo exhibition and it's an event that I'm planning to hold called Mad Grad. And it's an alternative graduation to celebrate MAD and neurodivergent students. Uh, so just an image description, there's a picture of a graduation cap that says, I did it with psychosis. Uh, it's really glittery and purple, and there's uh, pink and white sharks on it. <laughs> so yeah, I really want to include those who've also dropped out or couldn't access school for whatever reason, or were put on involuntary leave. And I want this event to be a resistance to the capitalist values that um, equate having a formal higher education and productivity as the most valued ways to be successful. And it's really personal to me as I've just graduated, but I chose not to attend my convocation because um, um, there's a significant like, amount of faculty who I felt created barriers for me, which almost prevented me from even graduating. And uh, because I d didn't go, I definitely had a level of FOMO if you're missing out. Uh, 
when I go, would go to my friends' graduations, and I realized that I still wanted to have a big celebration, so I thought, okay, I'm just going to create my own graduation. And uh, yeah, it's something I want to share with other um, people in the like mad near divergent disabled community. We can have our own valedictorian, honorary degrees, speeches, etc. And it's definitely something that's part social practice, part performance art, but 100% treated with legitimacy. And uh, it's also inspired by other alternative grads that exist, such as the Lavender Graduation, which is for LGBTQ plus students. And uh, there is a black graduation that happens at some different universities. So I think it'll be a really good send off for my solo show. And that is all I have to talk to you about today. So thank you for listening to me talk about my art practice. <laughs> yeah, and if you want to follow me or keep in touch, that's my personal Instagram and my website. So thanks. Hi, everyone. Hope you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Laura Prieto, and I'm going to be introducing our next artist on the panel. So, Alex Bomer. Alex Bomer is a born and raised Canadian writer, director, and performer. Alex has written, directed, and performed across Canada and the United Kingdom. She is a New York Radio Award nominee, Society of Canadian Musicians Award recipient, writer of two award-winning short films, and writer of the stage play Smudge which earned two Best New Play nominations in Canada and was Time Out Critics' Choice during its UK premiere. Now living in the UK, Alex has written for the Royal Court, London 2012 Olympics, Grey A, B BBC Radio, winning an AMI award for her adaptation of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Channel 4 series cast-offs nominated for BAFTA and Royal Television Society Award, and Facefront. She has worked as literacy manager with Gray, directed with Extant Theatre, Payne's Plough, and is co-founder of Invisible Flash UK. Her teaching and workshop interests are in playwriting and voice, particularly for communities often excluded from the arts. So we have our presentation from Alex Bulmer. Thank you. Uh, is my microphone on? Can everybody hear me? Um, I obviously need to... <laughs> proofread my bio because I now live in Canada, so I'll just be updating that. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I have, um, I, get, I I've nearly been working in, uh, in the arts as a professional for 30 years, which is ast astonishing to me, really, uh, considering the number of times I thought I was going to throw in the towel. Um, and I did spend uh, nearly half of that time in fact, probably exactly half of that time uh, working in the UK, which uh, really reshaped um, my idea of a future and um, my sense of self and politics as a, as a blind, uh, blind woman, blind artist. And, um, and I thought what I would talk about today was just sort of um, this, this opportunity gave me a chance to reflect over the over the, the 30 years, and I sort of I can I can put the I, I think I can put the journey into um, what I would guess call different artistic eras. And the first artistic era for me was something I would call <laughs> what the fuck, uh, <laughs> because it was when I was uh, diagnosed with a condition called retinitis pigmentosa, and I was 21 years old. And I had every intention of becoming an actor. Um, and the uh, acting schools and the, the profession had pretty much every intention of preventing me from doing that. <laughs> um, because in those days, back in the day, um, uh, we weren't having these conversations. Nobody was talking about this stuff. And so um, I felt that my only opportunity to stay in the profession was to train as a voice teacher, which I'm glad I did because it's, it's opened up a whole other uh, interesting um, avenue for me. Uh, but I think also by, um, through studying voice, I also became very interested in writing. And so I started to write about the, um, 
the experience of, of uh, losing sight, which then transformed into the experience of becoming blind. Um, and I, I chose mediums according to what it was I specifically wanted to say. So really the first piece of work I did was a piece called Life Unseen, uh, which was an audio installation with a, an audio engineer named, um, and designer named Darren Copeland. Uh, that was back in, I think, 1994. And that project really illuminated for me that um, I could find a, a sense of a, uh, a, a potent future through art. Some, it, it really felt to me that if I didn't stay in the arts, I would become a statistic. Um, so I, after that project, started to write, and write, and write, and write, and write about my despair, and write about my, um, the transition from seeing to not seeing. And that writing felt like a vehicle, just to keep me moving forward. And eventually that writing turned into a short film called Beauty, um, which explored the way that my mind that was once, uh, that, that was familiar with sight was now um, creating images in my head according to how I was hearing voices and, uh, and also the energies of people around me. And then a few years later I created a stage play called Smudge, which um, also very autobiographical and looked at um, my experience of sight loss. I didn't perform it, I didn't want to. Um, and for me at the time, I actually thought it was going to be my sort of, uh, a bit of a eulogy to my, to my artistic career because I had kind of come to a point where I thought, I don't know if I can go much further. Um, and it turned out to be exactly the opposite. Um, it sort of launched me into a place where, um, well, I had an opportunity to go to England and with the show, and by doing so, I became part of a community of disabled artists in a way that I never thought was possible. And I think that really showed me the importance of, of community in terms of personal transformation. It just isn't possible on your own. I don't believe it. Um, and I knew that in order for me to keep moving forward uh, as an artist, um, I had to be, I had to have connection with the community. Um, and I've been uh, interested in this idea ever since, this whole idea of the relationship between personal growth and community growth and communities of concern that, that nudge us towards risk, that uh, take care of us in times of failure and keep us connected to a sense of the future. So that's what I had while being in the UK for 14 years. And um, I sort of moved into a different era, which was to think more about how audiences engage with work. Um, and, I, and it's interesting um, uh, what, uh, uh, is, it, is it Rebecca? Yeah. Yeah, what Rebecca was just saying about, you know, how access can be a, a, a kind of a, a launch pad for creativity and not an afterthought. That became pretty much the kind of, um, the lead idea of, of a lot of my work while I was in the UK. Um, and I decided, after 14 years of being there, to come back, largely because it was all, t it was too good. There was too many opportunities over there. There were too many systems that were supporting disabled people to thrive. And it made me mad <laughs> that I wasn't here, where I felt my energies would be more uh, important. So I came back, and uh, I would say I'm in an era now which I call which is about blind imaginings. And for me, blind imaginings is something I discovered while um, on a project, which was a blind travel writing project that I did in 2015. And my intention was to travel through Germany and Spain and, uh, and France in a very short period of time and write about it and follow in the footsteps of, an, of a 19th century blind traveler and writer named James Holman. And after about 12 days in Germany and eight cities, I collapsed and went home to London and s lay under my duvet for days listening to Joan Rivers' books and feeling sorry for myself. And I thought, how could I have imagined that I could travel, you know, eight cities in 12 days? And then I realized the answer was in the question. It's not how could I, it was how did I? And I discovered that my imagination had not kept up with me. 
it had not transformed. It was stuck in my sighted past. And I was imagining as if I was still a sighted person. And then I was constantly in these sort of shocked situations where I was like, ah, I don't know where I am. And so traveling was just a nightmare because I didn't know how to imagine tomorrow as a blind person. So I kind of put myself in training. And then I realized this is an amazing workshop opportunity for anyone to attempt to imagine blind and how that can open new pathways for creativity. And just as an example, um, you know, if I say imagine a frog, some of you may be picturing a frog in your head. Um, not everybody has uh, 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 what is it called? Uh, a mind's eye. Some of you may be imagining what the frog sounds like. Some of you may be imagining how it leaps. And so what I'm starting to do is use the non-visual part of my imagination, that leaping or the sound, as a way to push my work forward or as a way to lead a process. And that's been quite exciting. Um, I applied that to um, a project called Scatting recently with Common Boots Theatre. And the whole notion of imagining uh, blind audiences also contributed to the integration of um, live audio description in our recent... Uh, I should have said that, that I'm um, now co-artistic co director of Common Boots Theatre, and we recently created the election with integrated audio description. So that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, and my projects at the moment involve a lot of walking and a lot of relationship between myself and space and understanding the difference between space and place and home and um, taking a real interest in the kind of the archaeology of, uh, of tiny spaces and clues and how like the 23 centimeters of my footstep and sound around me gives me gives me these c clues of where I am and, and I kind of put them together like a, like a perceptual archaeologist to end up with a hole. Um, Alice, yeah? I'm going to give you a cue. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. That's a perfect. That's perfect. That couldn't be better. Okay, so I have a favor to ask <laughs> because there's this parable that I'm very interested in, but I, I just don't know. I, I don't know the politics of it, so I wanted to ask. And it's a parable that's called The Elephant and the Blind Men. Now, some of you may know it, but I'll just summarize it briefly. It's a parable which tells the tale of six blind men who encounter an elephant. One of them is standing at the tail and says, oh, it's a rope. One of them is standing at the trunk and says, oh, an elephant is a big snake. Another one is at a leg and says, oh, an elephant is a tree trunk. And another one is holding its ear and says, oh, an elephant is a fan. And another one taps the side of the elephant and says, oh, it's a wall. So they've all encountered the elephant through touch and concluded that their perception is true. And then they get together and they fight <laughs> and they come to blows. And they all think they're right and everybody else is wrong, and they never discover the miracle idea of an elephant. Now, I really like that story for a lot of reasons. It speaks to me for, it speaks to the way I understand the world piece by piece. It also speaks to me because I've been considering a lot about how we need to have the courage to understand and speak to different values. But I don't know if it's like politically incorrect to tell that story. So can somebody tell me, is, that, is there a problem with that story? And if so, what can I do to fix it? What can I do to resolve it? How can I adapt it? Because I want to use the story. Shall I just leave that until question time? Yeah. Okay, I'll leave it until question time. Thank you.
All righty, perfect. Thank you so much, Alex. My name is Cameron, and I'm going to be the next presenter. I have the pleasure of presenting Vanessa Dion Fletcher. Um, she is a Lenape and Padawami neurodiverse artist. She graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2016 with an MFA in performance, and she exhibited across Canada and the U.S at the Muir Montreal, East Edge Gallery in Newfoundland, and the Queer Art Festival Vancouver, as well as Satellite Art Show Miami. Her work is in the Indigenous Art Center, Joan Flash Artist Book Collection, V-Tape, Seneca College, and the Archives of American Art. In 2019, Fletcher is supported by the City of Toronto Indigenous Partnerships Fund to be artist in residence at OCAD University. Fletcher employs um, porcupine quills, wampo belts, and menstrual blood to reveal the complexities of what defines a body physically and culturally. Reflecting on, the, on an Indigenous feminist body with a neurodiverse mind, Fletcher creates art using composite media, primarily working in performance, textiles, and videos. And uh, pass it off to you. I'm just going to do a quick uh, switcheroo. I think we just press. So that is my um, professional introduction. Um, my uh, second introduction is in the Lenape language. It's Kungunalowa, Nijishinzi Vanessa, Niha Lenape Potuatame Okwau, Nonje Nahi, Toronto Wakiti, Anishik. Uh, so I begin by, intru by introducing myself in the Lenape language, saying that I'm glad to see you all. Uh, to all my relations, my name is Vanessa. I'm a Potawatomi and Lenape woman. I'm from downstream, and I live in Toronto. Uh, thank you um, to Eliza for hosting this event and for everybody who's joining us today. Um, I want to share in that um, really... Um, thorough land acknowledgement, um, and to thank the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat um, for taking care of this place um, and uh, this land, the animals, um, and by extension, all of us. So my art practice is a process of investigating the influence of culture and politics on a relationship between our bodies and the land. Uh, as was said in my introduction, I create art using different types of media, primarily working in performance, video, and textiles. Language, fluency, and understanding in the context of my Potawatomi and Lenape ancestry is a driving force in my work. My interest in communication comes from my lack of access to my indigenous languages um, and from my learning disability. This perspective of language is fractured and politicized. I was born into English, the third child my mother's body carried. She likes to tell me, don't forget, the egg that made you was inside me when I was inside grandma. You are connected to all of your ancestors. I was born into love, conceived to help heal the colonial violence in the bodies that carried me. I was born speaking a colonial language, wrapped my developing child's brain and tongue around English words. It was not long before I knew something wasn't right. I was four years old when I told my mom that someone met the boxes in my brain wouldn't open. Two years later, this problem would become more ev evident to the outside world when I failed to meet developmental milestones. My experience of the English language was and is a puzzling and confusing mess filled with failure, shame, and fear. 
At the same time, in these early years of my life, I was learning the joy and pain of my indigenousness. I learned why I spoke English, residential schools, Moravian missionaries, forced removal, assimilation, survival. I learned my indigenous ancestors were made to feel the same failure and fear about speaking their language as I was about not being able to communicate in English. The Lenape community I come from has very few speakers, a handful of elders who still speak fluently. I learned my family did not speak our language but had the memory of it. My grandmother remembered songs sung in the night while the children and Indian agents slept. I knew there was another world, a world with indigenous languages. I knew that world had existed, but did not exist for me. I was told our languages were oral, filled with stories not written down. This world became my utopia, and I imagined it as a fictional place because colonialism had made it unreal and unattainable. As a fictional place, I envisioned it in all the perfection a utopic imagining allows for. Like Utopia, I have glimpses of this world, moments when I can almost find it. I'm going to play a video. Um, there's just a couple of um, drops of blood in it. So if you find it difficult to watch, you're welcome to close your eyes or look at your page um, or leave the room. Um, and I'm going to narrate a little bit over top of it. Um, and there's no sound. Let's do a little audio description in the video. We see um, my mouth and my fingertip. My fingertip is hold, held up really close to my mouth. And in my other hand, I have a porcupine quill, and I push the tip of the quill into the tip of my finger, and slowly a little, I pull it out, and slowly a little drop of blood appears. I'm kind of pinching my fingers together to make that little drop of blood appear. Porcupine quills were used before the introduction of glass beads, dyed and embroidered onto clothing, moccasins, and baskets. They were used for tattooing and other ceremonial piercings. Uh, to be used for embroidery, the quills need to be softened and flattened. Currently, they are soaked in dishes of water and flattened with a bone. Uh, but a long time ago, they would be put in the mouth warm saliva softening them, pulled out for your, through the, your teeth to flatten them. Um, so in the video, I put the, um, the quill after it's pierced my finger, I put it into my mouth and take out, take another quill and repeat the process. I wanted to feel the same thing my people did years ago. I can't speak my language but can fill my mouth with quills like words I'll never know. Hold them on my tongue, wanting to choke a little out of sadness. Placing the quills in my mouth, I inhibit my ability to speak English. But I'm using a language of textile, a language of animals, and a language of gesture. In 2016, I turned this action into a performance for an exhibition called Crying Out Loud at the Center for Contemporary Art in Santa Fe. Writing about the exhibition, McCole Hebron says, Crying Out Loud is a juried exhibition that examines the role of women and femmes' voices as expressed in art about politics, activism, and emotion. Considering the metaphoric and literal voice, Crying Out Loud explores and celebrates the use of art as a form of speaking up and speaking out. Okay, so the video is over now. I've moved on to a, uh, another slide that's of me doing uh, this performance. I'm in front of um, a couple people 
with two more people standing around me. Um, and I have quills in my mouth um, and I'm handing a quill to a person. In my performance, offensive, defensive, I approach the audience members one by one. Maintaining eye contact, I slowly remove a quill from my mouth and offer it to them. This intimate gesture builds a momentary connection between us. I repeat this cycle through the audience. Uh, colonization has targeted uh, craft and textile practices as a means of oppression. In Canada and the U.S., legislation outlawed cultural practices such as the sun dance and potlatch. Art objects, ceremonial objects, and clothing were bought, taken under duress, and stolen from families and communities. Colonizers reckon, recognized the power in our work and took it away. As a young person, much of the Potawatomi and Lenape artwork I saw in museums uh, I saw was in museums, owned by Western institutions. In this performance, I become the subject and owner of the quill. Sometimes intimidating audience members with my proximity, I'm simultaneously vulnerable. The romantic mythical Indian is not available for their consumption or ownership. Instead, I offer myself and an individual quill. Whenever I present this work, I'm always asked, where do you get the quills? Uh, so when I started this work, I um, started by ordering them off the internet uh, because that was an easy and accessible source. Um, and then as they became a more important aspect of my work, I um, pursued how to um, harvest the quills from a porcupine. So the quills, um, uh, here I'm harvesting them from a porcupine that was the unfortunate victim of roadkill, um, which is one of the most common ways people do it now. Um, but if there we had fewer roads and we still wanted to harvest quills, um, you can do it by throwing a blanket over the porcupine um, or by hunting them. Uh, the quills are um, a kind of modified hair, um, and you can start to get a sense um, in the photo that the um, porcupines have over 300, no, 30,000 quills on them. That's a rough estimate. Um, so each, each porcupine carries many, many quills, and they sh also shed them uh, as we do our hair. So finding language, a word scavenger hunt, is the next work I'm going to talk about. Oh, that's just me pulling some out, but that's okay. Um, so yes, finding language, a word scavenger hunt. I'm going to talk about the first iteration of this work that I did, which was at the Oise Library. I also performed it later um, at Cripping the Arts. Uh, anyway, so th um, in this uh, performance, I look at language. I'm kind of s I'm searching the library um, for language and words that I have a relationship with. Uh, the first one is corn, a word that makes you feel good, which I found in a card catalog that has been transformed into a seed bank. The second one, a neurodiversity, a noun you identify with. Uh, so I found my words and used them as a point to talk about what I'm sharing with you here today, my experience of language and colonialism um, intersecting with uh, disability. Um, but these, um, these are my personal reflections, but um, I know that other people also have stories um, of language and their kind of personal relationship to the words that they define themselves with, the way other people define them, and their interactions. So I wanted a way to start to find out um, what other people's relationships were. So I took my words and my prompts and made these um, made little, little note cards and invited all of the participants to um, go on this kind of 
journey through the library and to look for their own words um, at the same time. And in this first iteration, uh, I embroidered the quills with uh, some quill work. So there was an exchange of language, um, uh, as well as a kind of physical exchange of um, art. So this slide shows uh, the two sides of the card. One says finding language, a word scavenger hunt. Introducing myself in, in my language. These introductions are common among indigenous people. One identifies their name, um, uh, their clan, their nation, and their gender. In Lenape, I, one might say, Niha Lenape Kwe. I am, an, um, I am a Lenape woman. Uh, these are not words I have always known. Uh, as I said, my grandmother heard her parents singing Lenape songs while she was in bed, uh, but they didn't teach her the language. They had attended residential schools and lived in a time and place where it was not seen um, as an advantage to speak their indigenous language. Um, so as a child and a young person, I grew up and I didn't hear my language, but I heard um, other people from other nations introducing themselves in this way. In their words, I understood their pride in their nation, their culture, and their gender, in who they were as indigenous women. I began to consider, consider the way um, that I took pride and understood myself as a Lenape woman. In these reflections, the process of menstruation became an important action and experience that could not be ignored. So I'm now showing a slide of an artwork called Marked, which is uh, beadwork on a round canvas. Um, and the, the canvas is covered with a, a floral upholstery fabric. Um, so the, the floral is kind of raised, um, even though it's, so it's all, it's all white. But yeah, there's a kind of shaded floral white, white pattern. Uh, and then on top of that is uh, beadwork of a, menstrual, of a menstrual stain. So I've translated the reddish, brownish, maroonish colors of menstrual blood into kind of bright red and pink beadwork. Uh, menstrual stains, trans so I've transformed them into these desirable, shiny, beautiful marks. A Western progress narrative often assumes an irrelevance of a feminist practice. When I was making this work um, in the spring of 2016 in, in, at school in Chicago, I was often met, met with critique that feminist art was passé and that this conversation had happened um, in the 70s. I was confident um, that myself and others would never be done making meaning of our gendered and cultured bodies and that, unfortunately, a feminist body practice is far from irrelevant in our current social and political context. Indigenous women know that our bodies are constantly under attack. Our menstrual blood represents the possibility of more indigenous children, which stand in the way of the colonial project that would see the complete disappearance of indigenous people. Colonial Comfort is a Victorian settee upholstered in that same white floral pattern. Um, I have meticulously stained the settee with menstrual blood. The persistence of the female indigenous body bleeds through the white surface. 
in this close-up image, we see the um, menstrual blood that's now turned brown, um, filling in the shape of the floral pattern, uh, and the porcupine quill returns kind of seemingly to grow out um, of this blood. Uh, so the porcupine quill offers its defense, growing out of the surface. Depending on which way you look at this quill, it could be uh, a defense or a threat. So to wrap things up, my grandmother was a skilled sewer, to bring it back to family at the end here, uh, who made clothes for her five children, her husband and herself seven people. My grandmother tells me story, or my mother tells me stories of being a frustrated child as my grandmother would rip out and re-sew the inside seams to be perfect, even if no one was ever going to see them. Uh, grandma was, she was not taught uh, quill work or beading um, or basketry. She innovated and adapted and taught herself how to sew clothing for her family. In her later years of her life, she developed several um, health conditions that affected her um, motor skills, so her, her hands and also her speech. Um, when I first learned the stitches for beadwork, I proudly showed them. I proudly showed her my work. That's okay. Um, so I showed her the, the first sample of beadwork that I had made. She uh, pointed to the bunching fabric and told me that I had been pulling my thread too hard. A reminder to have pride in your work and a thing well made that will speak for you when words cannot. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. My name is Mimi, and I will be presenting our fourth and last presenter. Last but not least is Yusuf Kadura. Yusuf Kadura is an actor, writer, and producer who was born in Midwestern United States but relocated to Ottawa where he was raised and graduated from the National Theatre School of Canada. In 2018, Yusuf was also the curator in residence at the Tangled Art Gallery. Having been exposed to the political discourse between the U.S. and Canada, Yusuf understood the influence that literature can have on a population of people. He spent a great deal of time mentoring youth and disability groups, then continued to open up important conversations on disability issues after appearing in various plays held throughout Quebec, Ontario, and Ottawa. Yusuf also hosted a successful podcast that was funded by the National Theatre School of Canada called Walking the Space that invited artists who live with physical disability to discuss their relationship with the Canadian theatre. Yusuf continues to create and produce art in many forms that hold the power to educate his audience, to prompt a deeper understanding of disability experience. Hello, hello, there we go. Um, hi folks, uh, so yeah, my name's Yusuf Kudura. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, what I wanted to talk about today um, was, is my practice um, as an actor and artist here in Toronto um, and the things that I'm seeking to, uh, to expand and grow in my own craft uh, and in the community here. Um, to get started, 
I moved here from Montreal back in 2017 um, by a fluke. I was, um, I was a part of uh, what was called the Republic of Inclusion uh, in Ottawa, which brought together mad, deaf, and disabled artists from across Canada and parts of the UK to uh, spend two weeks together creating, learning, and sharing with each other. Um, and while there, I met an artist uh, named Cyrus Marcus Ware, um, who uh, outside in a smoker's pit at the end of the, uh, the process convinced me to come to Toronto for a few months to uh, try working there and see what happens. And three years later, I've maintained here. Um, the things that I'm seeking to do in my practice as an artist revolves mainly around movement. Um, I, as a, as, as a disabled artist, I've found um, in my training at the National Theatre School and the professional environments that I've worked in um, that there's certain ways in which uh, people are directed to, to move, to exist, to be, um, especially in the theatre world. Um, so, to start off, I, uh, my, my first experimentation with that actually began at the National Theatre School um, with a production of King Lear. Um, and in that production, I had the honor of playing uh, Edgar, um, who partway through the play um, feigns madness and becomes a character called Poor Tom. And in the description, he takes off all his clothes, stripping naked, feigning madness for about half the play. And the director came up to me and he was like, so Yusuf, I need you to think, uh, he's from the UK, um, he's like, so Yusuf, I need you to uh, think about what exactly you want to do for Poor Tom. Um, like, just think about like how you want to really get into it. So I thought about it, and then about two days later, I went back to him and I was like, I think I'd like to take off my leg. And he was like, oh, okay, brilliant. Um, do you want a cane, crutches? And I was like, I think I would like to crawl around on the ground. Um, and so for this play, I managed to uh, convince the director to let me um, crawl around half naked on stage in my underwear without a prosthetic on. Um, which was just an incredible amount of fun. Um, like, I had so much joy with that. Um, and that really hit for me that there is joy in the work which I try to pursue, and the easiest, w or the, the most intriguing way that I've found that has been through uh, movement. Um, since coming to Toronto, I've also had the opportunities to work at uh, Tangled Art Plus Disability as the curator in residence back in 2018. Um, and while there, it was working in a gallery setting which I had had no experience with up until that point. Um, but the wonderful folks there were so helpful and uh, allowed me to bring in parts of my practice to what we were doing in the gallery setting. Um, and so while there, I produced a play called Mad Ones, um, which explored um, the switch f to uh, uh, moral treatment uh, at Bethlehem Asylum back in, oh gosh, uh, late 18th century, I believe. Um, and the movement that emerged from that and people actually getting the chance to express their experiences in the arts world um, through theater. Um, and uh, also, after that, I managed, I, uh, I was lucky enough to work on Cripping the Arts with some fantastic folks here right now, actually. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Alex and I co-produced the uh, performance portion of it. Um, and while there, a piece was brought from the UK called Brownton Abbey, which is described as a Afrofuturistic space church. Um, and that was basically a gigantic party with performance bursts throughout it, uh, for which I created a piece where uh, I came on stage with a spell book and a big bag of garbage um, and cast a spell where I created a puppet out of the garbage uh, that I inhabited. Um, and I, I guess I'm speaking about this because I really want to get at how 
important movement is um, in my practice, um, while also explaining like the 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 complexity of that. Um, as a disabled artist, I certainly see the points of privilege that I come from being a right leg below knee amputee. Um, there are, like, I, I was billeted as the first disabled student to ever attend the National Theatre School um, by a few people. I'm not entirely sure if that's entirely accurate, but that's what people were saying while I was there. But I definitely could see during my time there and since I've left, um, part of the reason that that was able to happen was because of uh, the specificity of my disability is something that's very easily hidden. Um, if I choose to wear long pants, none of you would really know uh, that I was an amputee unless I expressly said something. Um, so it's with those, that, that, that in mind that I see uh, we have a need to, to create spaces and opportunities for people um, to be able to explore um, movement and how we physically inhabit the world. Um, as disabled people, as artists, um, because f I, I often think about adaptability. Um, my poor Tom, that was how I adapted to moving on that stage. Um, Brownton Abbey, the puppet that I made, again, I also removed my prosthetic because that gave me um, a different way of moving that was more effective for that piece. Um, and in that is where I find a lot of joy in the work. And I think that that is the main thing that I'm trying to go for. Um, I've also recently uh, started a new theater company uh, with some friends of mine that we are calling Other Hearts, um, H-E slash arts, um, where we are exploring, well, as a new company, we have sort of ideas of our mandate and things like that, but we all came up against the problem of we weren't seeing work that was inspiring us or, or filling us with what we needed. Certain artists in particular, of course, um, all the people here are like amazing, um, but in the theater world, there's so much that uh, you come up against in terms of, you know, what's your hit? Like when you go into an audition room, like what is it about you that you're selling? Um, and it's, that's something that I just can't stand, really. It's, 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 it's trying to sell something that may not actually be there. Um, I've had many directors in the past uh, for performances come up to me and be like, so Yusuf, I need you to think about how did your character lose their leg? And I'm like, is that in the text? And they're like, no, no, but I just need you to think about it. And I'm like, can't they just be an amputee? Um, so it, what really intrigues people? What are we actually trying to say with the work that we do? Um, it's, it's a complicated thing for me, one that I'm still struggling with. I've only been a professional, I've only been in the professional world for about three years now since graduation. Um, and I've been very lucky and very privileged with all the work that I have been able to do um, uh, with the wonderful people here um, and in Toronto on the whole. But there are some big shifts that need to take place. Um, shifts that will allow us to have more joy in the work um, without burning out due to the capitalist uh, system that we're all working within. Um, because it's a system that isn't built for us. Um, and it's a system that demands too much of people. Uh, so we really need, so those shifts are the things that I'm intrigued about. I'm, I have a lot more questions than I do answers to any of the things that I do. Um, but again, I keep going back to this, but that's where the joy and the fun comes from. Um, like any opportunity uh, within that, like the performance of uh, you know, just being an actor in Toronto, there's a degree of performance to that. Um, you know, how we sell ourselves or uh, uh, again, again with the hits or, um, you know, 
the vast majority of actors, people I went to school with, very talented people, um, where you work as a, uh, as a waiter or a barista or something for the vast majority of your time and then occasionally get a bit of work. And to me, accessibility is about changing those systems um, and uh, by eliminating the idea of like looking for what everyone's hit is, um, we can create a space that's more about uh, the individual experiences of the people and the messiness of who we all are. Because that to me makes much more intriguing work uh, than you know, uh, a standardized Hamlet again. Um, I do love Hamlet, but like, uh, uh, yeah. Um, what am I doing on time? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm the, in that seeking out of joy and things like that, I remember when I first uh, found myself drawn to theater. And I was in my last year of high school, and my class took a trip to the Stratford Festival. And there was a, uh, there was a, a production of Othello going on at the time. And I saw that, and I went up to my teachers, and I was like, hey, I think I want to do this like for real. I want to be an actor. And they were like, yeah, sure, because I didn't care. I was terrible in high school. Um, um, but then as I kept working on it and I was coming up with the fears of like looking at the industry, looking at the people who are dominating this industry in Canada um, and in the US, um, I came up with the fears of do people actually want to see me on stage? Like who, would, like who would be willing to cast me? Who would want to see me? And I didn't think that that was a possibility because I had not seen that in media. I hadn't seen that on stages. Um, and I went up to a teacher of mine and I brought this question to him. And he said one thing that stuck with me. And that was, Yusuf, if you ever play a Hamlet, you're not going to be playing Hamlet. You're going to be playing a Hamlet who happens to have one leg because no one actually becomes Hamlet on stage. Um, and that was what made me go, oh yeah, it's just a part of who we are. And it's the diversity of who we are and those experiences and the diversity of us as people that creates, um, that creates good theater which is all I really care about. Um, accessibility is a big part of my practice. Um, community, activism, um, producing, finding people who care. But to me, I think that it all, come, it all circles around to um, the work being good and joyful for everyone involved. And we can only really do that if we have that diversity of voices and people in the room. Um, and as a, again, as a, I guess I'm no longer emerging, but as a previously emerging um, actor, now semi-established, um, you know, there's, I'm, I'm starting to see that shift here in Toronto. And it's beautiful, but like there's more work that needs to be done, clearly, I think. Um, but I also think that we will do fine as long as we maintain joy in what we do. For me, that's through movement, but I hope that everyone here has some way in which they find joy in the work or even just entering a room. Um, you know, I mean, I've had bad experiences with people in my prosthetic and people I've worked with before, um, but I always try and seek to find, find that joy. Um, for example, uh, we're going to do a quick scene very quickly. Um, you're going to be someone I'm working with. Just ask me what happened to my leg. Um, I was born with a condition called dismemberophilia. It's where your limbs randomly fall off. It can happen to anyone at any time. Um, that's a lie, but it's a way that I... <laughs> it's things like that in which I try and find joy and bring it into the room. Um, <laughs> maybe more so joyful for me. Um, but anyways, on that note, thank you all for listening. Um, Okay, so um, we have about 
half hour. Um, we're going to take the rest of the time to do a QA. and a um, We will go through uh, our questions. If anyone else has a question, feel free. Grab the mic for a sec. Um, so yes, we'll and we'll try to end around uh, one fifty-five because there is another class in here too. And I also want to put Alex's ta um, question back on the table. So so I think we'll just um, start with the group questions as well as Alex's question, and that probably will be it. But I think um, that what we can do to extend our time together is to move across the hallway into the, the School of Disability Studies um, lounge. So if any of the artists are able to stay a few minutes longer, we can continue on, on there. Um, but that, this will pro pro probably take our time for today. Uh, with that being said, we'll start with Alex, uh, the question with the parable. So if anyone wants to participate, um, no. Yeah. I just wanted to know um, why you thought that it was too PC. Why I thought it was too PC? Yeah. No, I think it's not PC. The, the parable? Yeah, my concern is that um, it's using the experience of blindness to um, make a really good point. Like, I love, I love what the parable is saying. I'm, my concern is, um, is, it, is it stereotyping blind people as um, people who can only uh, um, comprehend a part of something? Oh, that's, I totally understand that. Yeah, that's my question. I get and, it. Thank you. Know, you. And how do, I, you know, how do I use the parable sensitively? Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we had someone raise their hand in the back. Sorry, just from my perspective, the blindness didn't even come into play. It was just looking at the same thing from multiple perspectives. So I don't think you have a problem with that at all. That's interesting. Hmm. Does anyone else have a take on Alex's question? Um, I don't know if you want to actually even just re reiterate the, the question that you initially had. Um, yeah, I mean, my question is, is telling that parable putting a blind person at risk of feeling that they are being stereotyped as uh, n not having the capacity to comprehend the whole? So what do we do about parables? <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, thank you, Alex, for your wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I think your parable is wonderful. I am blind also. Aha. Uh -huh. I, I thought it was wonderful. I am very... Uh, I'm, I get tired sometimes of political correctness. Uh, though I think that we need to be respectful for... for our politics as blind people or whatever we are. But I thought, what an interesting thing, because I understood it completely as I was following you as a blind person. Of course, you go part by part. Uh -huh. And I think it is good because it shows people who do not understand how we see or how do we get to perceive the world. So I do think it is very worthwhile to explore it. And please do, because you are showing people how we perceive the world part by part segment by segment, and I think it is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. I really appreciate that feedback. You're very welcome. It's really helpful. Anybody else? No? Okay, I think Laura. Thank you. I mean, I just can't resist Alex to add something. It's Esther. Yes, it is Esther. And I, I just think you know, the, uh, the other piece, of course, is if you see the elephant, you won't know the elephant, right? If you're going to really lean into the blindness. Right. Of this group of guys who all hang out together. So there's your concerned community, I suppose. You could, 
I think it's how we rewrite and retell that parable. What does it mean to see the elephant and stand so close to the elephant that it looks like a wall and not an elephant, right? It, like you could, I, I think leaning into it takes care of any of the problems of stereotyping that come out of it. I'm going to get in touch with you about that. Thank you. <laughs> Because I, I, I like what you're saying. I'd just like to communicate with you a little bit more about it. Cool. I also, this is Lori, I also was thinking about how the elephant could be a wall, it could be a fan, mm -hmm. it could be all of the things that it's being described as. Um, so it's not like any of those individual uh, perceptions are wrong, right? Like right. the ear. Could be a really nice fan. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. Hi, Alex. It's uh, Heather Willis. Um, I think Hi, one thing o obvious, uh, obviously, is that it, it's it's in the hands of a blind person. So, um, you as a blind person have are, are are using it. So, there's just something in that versus someone who was sighted. Right. Hi. Yeah, I think you might also be in the clear just using it, just because I think in that parable, it's not really the blindness that's problematized so much as like the inability to cooperate. Like it's, I think you could definitely do something about like community and like instead of saying, no, this is my perspective and it's absolutely true. It's like, oh, how can we incorporate all these different perspectives into a larger like coherent whole? Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so as a group, we formulated a question um, based on what we received from the class. And as you previously mentioned, um, in film and television, the representation of minority groups, including the, or specifically the mad, deaf, and disability community, um, have historically been insufficient and tokenistic. So do you have another example of how you dismantle these tropes in your um, content creation and art? Oh, this is sorry. This is specifically for Alex. Yes, and then oh, it's if, for me. Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. ah. <laughs> I should have specified. We kind of grouped like, it like, together. Okay. But um, if anyone else, can I have the question repeated? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. So, um, as you previously mentioned, um, in film and television, yeah, the representation of minority groups, specifically the mad, deaf, and disability um, communities, has historically just been insignificant and tokenistic. So, do you have another example of how you dismantle these tropes in your uh, content creation or art? Um, for example, how you previously mentioned the mind's eye and taking on um, certain experiences and kind of flying with that to think about how you perceive the perspective with which you create your art? Um, I think I understand. Um, so I, 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 I'm wondering if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you've heard something that I said about writing characters um, uh, with the idea, w imagining them as uh, disabled characters, because many of my writing teachers said, no, don't do that. And um, the idea was that you didn't have to do that. You just, it was, um, it's what the casting people do. That the idea is like, we shouldn't, you know, that would, that would be limiting, that would be, um, that would be writing, that would be reductive. You'd write characters that was just about their blindness, you know, if you, if you dared to make a character blind or dared to make a character a wheelchair user, you know, they would have a, there would be no other narrative. And um, my argument was that, or certainly my, I guess t to answer your question, I think what I try and do is I embrace that. It's a specific, it's a wonderful specific tool. And I think it does get us away from the stereotypes because um, and it also, it also gets us away from this um, strange situation where, you know, you've got a, a wheelchair user who's in a scene and, and supposedly they're supposed to leap from one building to the next. Now, that could be really fun. Let's figure out how. But in film and television, they don't take that kind of time. And they, take, they have the, the, the time, the, 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 um, 
the uh, definition of time in film, film and tel television is, is uh, altogether something else. So I like the idea of writing it into the script because then they, it's there. And I think it's interesting to see what happens to a story when our plot twists and our character, uh, characterizations are informed by um, the needs we have and the, and the distinctive way that we function in the world. That, to me, is what keeps it from being a stereotype. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. is there a specific character um, in which this has manifested itself that you can tell us more about? Well, do you know cast-offs? Not personally. Oh, okay. Um, cast-offs is a television series I wrote for in the UK. Um, you can probably, it may be in the Ryerson Library, I'm not sure. Um, I know it's at York University, but um, Cast-Offs uh, was written by myself, uh, another dis, uh, disabled writer, uh, and, um, and all the characters were written to be disabled characters and were performed by disabled actors. So that's a pretty good example of, I think, where you can see characterizations that reflect humanity as well as the experience of of living disabled and interacting in a culture too because there's basically there's six disabled people that are stranded on an island and given a sheep and a pig and a chicken and they all have to live together uh, and survive and so you, you get a great chance to see also the notion of disability culture in a kind of framework that is very unusual. It's ca called cast-offs. Okay amazing thank you so much. You're welcome. So the next question is for Rebecca. Okay, so the question that we came up with is, um, so your work touches on themes of romantic intimacy and emotional vulnerability. How do these themes manifest themselves differently in the various media you work, such as poetry, zines, new media? And does any form lend itself to a particular kind of expression? Um, it's funny, the, yeah, those um, works are on my website. Mm -hmm. I didn't touch too much upon them today because I was yeah. just focusing on my mad art, my disability art. So um, these are less so on that, but more so just like general works around like, yeah, emotional and to see. Mm -hmm. quite your work touches on the themes of romantic. How do these themes manifest themselves differently in various media work? And it's just poetry, new media, and zines. So we'll push it. Um, I guess. I like to use a, a lot of documentation, a lot of mm -hmm. screenshots. I think like um, I really like, and I find this extends in different ways in my practice. The um, the way that um, you know found objects or found screenshots or Google searches or history can or medical um, notes or emails can tell their own story, um, and just putting them all together and letting them be contextualized on their own without. Um, really showing the hand of, you know, um, moving them around or um, placing them in a certain way. Um, yeah, I think that's really fun for me, and I think that um, I think the best art that's moved me the most has been the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so I like to look into um, those secret spaces, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the depths of uh, confidential emails and confidential medical documents or um, in my messy... Uh, just wild room that like I don't want to have anyone come in and over and see so um, I guess those are some ways that it manifests. Well, um, does anyone have any other questions for Rebecca? I just want to know what course you took or what program? Well, uh, I was in the creative industries program. Oh, yes, creative industries. And, uh, yeah, it's funny. My um, field is actually in ch um, television, like children's television. Okay. So I have, like, one foot in television and media and, like, one foot in art. So, yeah, and I took this class last year. And so would you, like, I, I'm, I kind of um, relate to your story a lot. And I just wanted to know, like, um, did you, do you consider yourself a disability artist? Um, yeah, I guess I consider myself a multidisciplinary artist, and okay. so I, because I do a lot of things, um, so I would, you know, I could list them up, you know, zinster, installation artist, but like I do, yeah, touch on, on mad and disability, like subjects, so in that way I'm a mad and disability artist, yeah. But you do, um, do art that is 
absolutely not related to mad and disability art? That's what I want to know. Um, yeah, I, and I want to say yes and no because at the same time, you know, I am a mad and disabled person and that lens will always come through in some way in my art. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just stop now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to know, like, when did you um, come to the realization or when did you decide you wanted to express yourself through art or wanted to start that journey of, like, mad art? Um, in art in general or mad art? Um, most specific, like, more speci specifically mad art. Like, mad art? when was, at what point did you realize, like, you wanted to express yourself on that matter? Um, honestly... <laughs> I was really inspired by this specific class. Yeah, like I was just um, thrown into a lot of knowledge I'd never really encountered before. And um, yeah, I just like fell in love with the theory and everything that I was reading and things that I was never exposed to before. So I think here um, in this class was like a really great starting point for me. Um, but I guess I had already, well, I had already been conceptualizing that show actually before I took this class. So I think this class gave me the foundation to really lift it off and, you know, my political framework was definitely changing over time, which enhanced my artistic framework, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, and then I also took History of Madness, which was also really helpful for me. So just because of time, we're going to ask our last two questions for Vanessa and Yusuf, and then afterwards, like, um, Eliza says, if anyone has any personal questions, when we move across the hall, we can definitely throw those out there. So this question is for Vanessa. In your artwork, you use materials like porcupine quills, wampum butts, belt, sorry, <laughs> and menstrual blood. Can you discuss how you came to use these materials and your decisions in doing so? Yeah, um, they each have a different, um, I guess, a, a different story. Um, I started to um, learn more and get a lot of teaching about wampum belts um, from um, uh, Louis Cruz when um, I was working with the Two-Spirit Skillshare at the time um, and was then invited into to an exhibition that centered around the dish with one spoon wampum belt. Um, so that, um, I guess is that story. Um, the menstrual blood I talked a little bit about in my talk, um, just um, thinking about trying to understand my physical body and the, re the way it related to um, my uh, culture, the way it related to, um, you know, politics and social situations. Um, and yeah, I was um, at the same, I was really um, kind of intrigued and interested by the physical material and also um, annoyed and repulsed by it. So I felt like that was a, um, you know, anytime you have that kind of tension, um, it's something that dr I'm drawn towards. Um, and yeah, the porcupine quills came out of um, starting to do beadwork and um, being interested in dyeing my own, like making my own colors. Um, and um, yeah, quills can be, can be dyed any color you want. That was one of the initial inspirations. Does anybody else have any comments now? Okay. So the last question is for Yusuf. Hi, hey, Yusuf. I'm Marianne. Uh, so as some of us know, Tangled Art Gallery is a nonprofit uh, arts organization here in Toronto, enhancing opportunities for mad, deaf, and disabled artists by showcasing and promoting their work. So I was wondering, uh, as, your ex as a curator in residence, what was your experience like working with artists to make their exhibitions more accessible? Thanks. Um, so when I got to Tangled, I had, I had not really worked much in, in the realm of accessibility, like, at all at that point in my career. Um, coming from National Theatre School, it wasn't something where there was any programs or any of that in place. Um, 
too trained about that. I did get a little bit um, done from some of my own volition and like curiosity around the subject. Um, and when I got to Tangled, I would say that was one of the most important experiences I've had, um, simply because the community of people who work there um, and the people who come to see the work um, all carry so much experience and understanding and openness. Um, and them passing on those skills to me around accessibility. And it wasn't just about the gallery setting. They also gave me opportunities to explore accessibility on stage, right? Um, with Mad Ones that I mentioned earlier. Like, um, yeah, working, working with Tangled and working with the artists and everyone to make it, to make the work accessible, um, it's, it's something that I'm still carrying with me and as I, every time I, I, I go to Tangle, but it was, it w I was only able to learn that and get that information because of the people um, and the community that Tangled has become uh, in Toronto. Yeah. Hello? Okay, perfect. So it is now 1.55, so we're just going to kind of wrap it up. We'd like to give a last thank you to all our artists who spoke today. If we can give them one last hand, please. And then one more big hand for Eliza for putting this all together for us. Thank you so much. Um, we actually have put up on the screen the social media platforms as well as the websites of each artist. If you want to take a picture, write any of them down. It's definitely a good thing to have so you can reference in the future if you need it. Perfect.